Состязание. По каким правилам будем драться? У нас нет правил. Good afternoon, Mr. Denny. For me, good morning. Good afternoon to you. Mr. Denny, unfortunately, we know that uh, the knife crimes is a real problem in the modern society. We, yeah, we can look to uh, criminal statistic and, of course, uh, we make a, a conclusion. It's a real problem. And that's why we created uh, the researching field. How to protect yourself uh, against a knife attack? And I have some question to you as a professional, as a master. And we can start right now. Be my pleasure. Okay. Uh, Mr. Denny, uh, let's start from the question, how long have you been practicing of martial arts? I began training in the winter of 1981 with a man by the name of uh, Sifu Paul Vizio of Fu Jiao Pai Kung Fu, Tiger Claw Kung Fu. And that was only for the last semester of law school. And then I went down to Washington, D.C. I did one year of Taekwondo. And in 1982, I began my training with uh, Guru Dan Inosanto and people uh, who I met through him. Why did you start to practice martial arts and... Uh, how did you met with uh, Mr. Inosanto? Well, I grew up in uh, New York City in the 1960s, which was uh, a very violent time. Uh, there was a lot of heroin at the time. There were a lot of junkies. The um, social dynamics of the city were such that there was just a lot of violence. It was a very violent place. And um, it was not until I had various incidents as part of growing up, uh, including at school, in high school. Uh, my high school was 20% uh, white, 40 black, 40 Puerto Rican, with about 10% of the school using heroin. And, um, I, you know, I, my second day in the school, I was attacked by three guys on the stairs. Um, there was a strange incident where I had a gang of uh, eight black lesbians waiting to attack me outside of the lunchroom uh, one day. Um, and so forth, but I didn't really do anything about it in my training until, uh, I didn't begin my training until many years later when I had just finished a semester of study in a Mexican law school between my university and going on to law school. And um, I, was, we, I was in southern Mexico with uh, a Mexican friend of mine, and we picked up two blonde American girls and their blondness and their inappropriate attire attracted some attention from some locals who uh, had been drinking and uh, the four of them tried dragging one of the girls off and there was a big fight. We ran to the police, the police, the policemen on duty, uh, they had run off saying, vamos al coche por la pistola, let's go to the car and get the pistol. So when we ran up to the policeman, we said, there are these guys after us and they have a gun. But he was a transit policeman, so all he had was a screwdriver. And you might say, well, why would a transit policeman have a screwdriver? Because if someone was parked illegally, he would remove the license plate and then sell it back to the person when they came back to the car. And that's how they enforce parking fines there. This is uh, in the mountains in Mexico near Guatemala. So local law enforcement methodology is, a, is what it was. And uh, so when they drove up chasing us in their car, he thinking that they had a gun and all he had was a screwdriver, he ran away. And um, so there was a very big wild fight. One of the guys had a knife, one had a car antenna, you know, one had a Coke bottle. And um, 
there was a big wild fight in front of the police station. The girls ran into the police station, which was about the size of possibly your office, and no one was in there, and so we barricaded ourselves in the police station. Uh, and these guys are trying to break down the door. And the girls say, call for help. And I say, where? The pol- we're already in the police station. And a bunch of things happened. We wound up, it's a long and very funny story in the telling. We were climbing out the back window to escape as the police arrived us arrived in force to see us climbing out the back window of the police station. They knew the four guys because they were from town. And when the dust cleared, we were thrown in prison for three days and we had adventures in the prison. And so it was with that that I decided, you know, I really need to have some proper training. And so my last semester of law school, as I mentioned, I began with uh, uh, Paul Vizio. It wasn't really what I was looking for, but it was what was available. And it wasn't until I got to Los Angeles in 1982 that I had the great fortune to meet Gurudan and Asanto, um, who is um, he's an American-born He's American, first generation of Filipino parents. And so he grew up in Stockton, California, which is a center of Filipino population in California. Uh, Because of the relationship of the United States with the Philippines, there's a lot of Filipinos in California. They're actually the second largest ethnic group. And because of the, his father was a man of respect in the community, he was trained by many of the teachers amongst the Filipinos and I learned from him. So there's a very direct lineage to the true training from the Philippines. And in the Filipino arts, what resonated for me was that my motive was not to compete for status, what we call young male ritual hierarchical combat, which is most martial arts. Some version, if I may be a little bit color colorful here, of some version of my penis is bigger than your penis, whether it's judo or jujitsu or boxing or kickboxing or mixed martial arts. It's a matter of set, uh, establishing hierarchy. Who is who is the alpha? Who is the beta? And for me, I was thinking more in terms of the incidents that I had had growing up in New York City, um, where you know, two or three in the morning, coming back from dropping off a particular girl I was seeing in the far reaches of the northern part called the Bronx, and you know, there come three junkies trying to. Uh, uh, get me so that they have money for their drugs for the night. Uh, so the Filipino arts being a weaponry oriented art and the unbroken lineage. The, 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 when you have a generation in an art where the fighting understanding is not experienced, the art tends to lose something. The, wis- the, the, tactic, the, the techniques may be there, but the wisdom necessary to unlock them that may die in the absence of uh, experience. And the Filipino arts have continuing lineage. And uh, Gurnasana is an extraordinary man, and I began training with him. Uh, Mr. Denny, do you think that in real street fight, it's possible to stay alive uh, in a combat against the knife? I absolutely think it's possible to survive. It's, you know, um, it's a question of luck, skill, fighting spirit. Uh, the world has changed with all the security surveillance cameras, the security cameras. So we actually get to see uh, many innocent incidents, many episodes where there are attacks and sometimes people survive and sometimes they don't. Um, I don't think there's anything that works all the time against everyone, uh, which is why in my teaching, I name my block of material for this, die less often. Uh, one can simply train to improve one's odds. Um, but I very much think it's possible to improve one's odds. And I've had uh, many people that I've worked with have come to me and they thank me for the training that it had made a difference in real situations for them. Uh, I've worked with a number of corrections officers, for example, and you know, for them this is a reality as part of their work that sometimes there will be a prisoner with what in American slang is called a shank which is, you know, made some sort of bar, it's, you know, to a point. So it's usually focused on a stabbing weapon, not, you know, there's not so much of a cutting edge. Um, and they have a, an attack that they, sometimes known as the prison sewing machine, the sewing machine that goes like this. And so they're just going like this very fast and aggressively uh, many times. So uh, I do think it's uh, possible to improve your odds, but... The more one does, you know, it's a 
sooner or later, things can go sideways. Maybe you know uh, or you can describe uh, some uh, secrets or some principles of surviving, surviving in these critical situations. The ability to operate in a condition of uh, an adrenaline dump, what sometimes we laughingly call condition brown. If you have not experienced an adrenaline dump, it is very easy to become overwhelmed by the adrenaline. Most people know that in response to an attack, in response to aggression, that they say, oh, there's two responses, fight or flight. You either fight or you run away. But actually, there's five possible responses. There's fight, flight, to freeze, to posture, by which I mean you puff yourself up and you try to look dangerous. Who do you think you're messing with? Uh, I'm going to mess you up. That's posturing. Or to submit, I give up, don't hurt me. So there's actually five responses. But the one that happens to many people, perhaps the most, is uh, to freeze. They're just overwhelmed by the adrenaline. They just, uh, and they just, they see it coming in and they just kind of freeze. The expression in American English is like a deer in headlights. You know, the deer is crossing the road, the car comes, he looks at the headlights. What are those? Smash, the car hits him. And so if you have not experienced adrenaline or in a condition brown, it's very easy to become overwhelmed. So in your life, if you've had an experience, on the other hand, where you know what it, you've felt adrenaline and you've learned to operate and to use it to your benefit, that's very helpful. I think it's very helpful to be able to, uh, to be in a physical condition where your heart can accelerate to a high, uh, high rate very quickly. If you've led a quiet, peaceful life and you're not terribly physical, not terribly fit, and with the adrenaline, your heart starts to boom, 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 uh, and you, you, you feel a, uh, your body is afraid of maybe inducing a heart attack or, you know, just being overwhelmed by the uh, high heart rate because the heart is not physically experienced with a high heart rate. Uh, you know, it can be possible even with good training to be overwhelmed by that as well. So um, I would say that those are two things that people sometimes forget about in their training. Tell me, please, what kinds of martial arts do you practice and uh, what was the reason you have started practicing in these martial arts? Uh, my principal training is in the Filipino martial arts. Our group uses the name Kali. Um, I also, beginning in 1990, started training in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu uh, with the Machado brothers. I'm a, a brown belt under Higa Machado. Uh, my training with Verona Asano also gives me background in uh, Muay Thai. Jung Fan Gung Fu. Uh, I have intermediate ranking in Savat. I think there's some useful material there. And uh, I'm currently training in Sistema with Martin Wheeler. There's some other things as well, but that's those are the ones that I think are the most, most important for me. As I understand, you have your own system with Dog Brothers. Maybe it's some mix of these styles, of these systems? Dog Brother Martial Arts began with me teaching people how to fight Dog Brothers real contact stick fighting. As such, it was uh, overwhelmingly Filipino martial art in its orientation, but with the uh, Jeet Kune Do concept mindset, uh, mindset that I uh, follow from my training with Gurren Asana, we freely feel free to integrate without having to say, well, that's not Filipino. We don't look at that. And uh, actually, I was the person who brought Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu to our fighting. And um, you know, some people criticize us saying, well, you only get to the grappling because of the headgear, the fencing masks that you wear. Um, and in many cases, that's true. But there is, it is possible to enter technically, and it's something that we teach. Um, to enter into the range, and so uh, the grappling method, I think, is very important as well. Um, and it, it, as time goes by, you know, uh, other things are brought in as well. Uh, Arlen Sanford, Salty Dog, he brought in the Muay Thai, the, the, the Thai art uh, called Corby Krabang, which is the military weaponry forerunner to the combat ring sport of Muay Thai. And so uh, we are in what might be called an open architecture. 
and so those are our those are foundational systems but other things you know we, we bring in as makes sense to us and the system evolved into uh, three basic areas the real contact stick fighting the empty hand system that I call Kali Tudo which uh, is meant to be a funny blend of Brazilian volley Tudo and Kali but um, the Brazilian uh, fighting that was before the early, first rules of the UFC allowed headbutts, they allowed groin punches and so forth, and it was called Vale Tudo, meaning valid total, anything goes. And so, um, and those then are the preparation for die less often, which is the integration of gun, club, knife, and empty hand. And the idea that I have is that the promise of Kali is true, which is that your way of moving should be the same regardless of whether there's a weapon or not, whether you know if there's a weapon or not. And that there's an, when you get to the die less often, that there's an inherent efficiency, in the, often in the split second of reality of a die less often interaction, where you do not have to identify, oh, this motion coming at me, it has a knife, so I do this. Oh, it's an empty hand, so I do that. You do not have time to download a different operating system. And so by having one operating system, the idea is to react more efficiently under adrenal stress. So the Kali Tudo system is where we adrenalize the empty hand to be applying the same movements that we use with the weaponry. And we use uh, the cage of mixed martial arts as a laboratory to, for that. Tell me please, Mr. Denny, how we can call the main idea of Dog Brothers system in one sentence or two sentences, the main key idea? I would call that, what we, we call that consistency across categories. Uh, also, if I may make a, a, an observation, there is the Dog Brothers, which is the real contact stick fighting, and then there is my system. Uh, I am the guiding force of the Dog Brothers. And then there is Dog Brother Martial Arts, of which I am the founder, which is my teaching. And so the two are not the same. I, I, I just It can be confusing for people who are not familiar with that. But I would say the underlying uh, principle is consistency across categories, that there's simply one way of moving, whether there's weapons or not. Tell me, please, in your opinion, is this model capable of protecting one against an edge weapon? Well, the people who tell me that it has saved their life would say yes, so I must agree with them. Not in all cases. Someone can always be overwhelmed. Uh, many knife attacks are by ambush. Um, but yes, I believe it is possible to dramatically improve one's chances. As I understand, you have uh, different cases in the past. Yeah. yeah, so I've had a number of corrections officers tell me uh, of they're using the system. Uh, I trained a uh, special forces unit that had to go somewhere where they could not have guns. And um, when they got back, they told me that it had made a difference for them. And um, I've had a couple, you know, some civilians as well. Oh, so you have a practice and experience uh, as an instructor of law enforcement uh, person? Absolutely. Uh, I'm a subject matter expert for intermediate force for the advanced training center for uh, our border patrol. Uh, I've worked with uh, various special forces units and uh, various police units, um, work with the uh, U.S. Air Marshals, um, work with agents for uh, the Drug Enforcement Agency. Pe you know, these are people who are sometimes undercover in uh, very dangerous circumstances with dangerous people. Uh, Mr. Denny, is there a certain tactique in your martial arts against a knife? Just against a knife, exactly. And uh, what type of tactique uh, does it offer? Yeah, no, I, I think certain things are just common to human violence in terms of tactics. Um, but a, a starting point for us is the belief that if we see an attack coming, that it's going to be, most of the time, what we call primal probabilities. We like dealing with primal probabilities first. Not, well, what if he's a master from the such-and-such such system? It's like, you know, you know so um, 
there's a conversation I had once with someone who had uh, killed people in prison. And um, I asked him what technique he used. And it's, it's a good story. I'll keep it short. But his answer was, there's no technique. You pump him until he's dead. And then you bind your wounds. So it was a question of pure animal ferocity. And uh, so there's a particular structure that I call the dog catcher, which allows us to handle primal killing aggression. Uh, when someone is in a primal aggressive state, uh, their movements tend to be more obvious. And the question becomes one of, can you handle the power and position yourself so that you're controlling the limb or that you get behind the person? And so uh, for us, the dog catcher is uh, very useful in that regard. And you know, I've had people use it successfully. As for you, what school of bladed weapons uh, do you think is the most dangerous one in terms of walking with empty handed? I will tell you a story is I had a camp where there were several instructors teaching. And one of the teachers, many of the Filipino systems can be very secret about teaching how to kill with a knife. They teach more, here are ways you defend against the knife. They show you some basics of if the attacker does this or that, but there's more advanced trickery that they tend not to show except to their, their own people behind closed doors. And so this particular group was showing some very aggressive stuff very openly. And another one of the teachers sat down next to me and he said, what do you think? And I said, wow, these guys are very deadly. And he said, ah, these guys are no good. And I was shocked because in the knife culture, people tend to be very polite because knife people can be very touchy and good manners is a good policy. And so I was shocked at how candid he was that he didn't like what they were doing. And I said, well, what do you mean? She said, ah, there's no good. All their attacks are from in front. You understand the point I'm making? Yeah. So knife is a weapon of murder. It's a weapon of ambush. Um, uh, my very good friend and uh, a federal corrections officer of Tremendous, serious experience, uh, Dogzilla. Um, he one time he showed me a diagram that they had captured from the prisoners preparing for a hit in the prison yard. And I don't know if you've seen the diagrams of American football plays. No, no, no. You know, they, they have the X's for one team and the O's for another team and little arrows. You go here and you go here. And the, you know, then when, you know, the, the play is very worked out. Mm -hmm. And so it was like that. Uh, it's like, okay, you know, this is where these guys are going to come in. This is where this one's going to come from here. He's going to pay because the group coming in from this side, they were going to be searched and the knife was hidden over here. So this guy was going to hand the knife, the, the shank to him for him to do the kill. And then after the kill, he was going to pass the knife off to somebody else and he was going to depart in another direction. So, um, you know, in the real world, when you have humans with the, uh, the will to kill, uh, the technique is often less important than the tactic. Uh, there's a footage that um, from a friend of mine in the, uh, the prison, uh, the corrections officers, the prison guard uh, union uh, here in California, he gave me, and it was showing a kill. The, uh, there's uh, a piece of exercise equipment called the dip bar where you're working your triceps, you're like this. You know what I'm talking about? No, no, no. Explain, please. It's a piece of exercise equipment where there's a bar here and here, and you get up on it, so your hand weight is supported on your hands, and you lower your body, and you're using your triceps. Ah, okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a very common piece of equipment. And the... Uh, the victim was doing that and you had one guy come up from his right with a grip like this where he's just going repeated motion stabbing up and another guy approaching from his left with the ice pick grip repeated motions going like this so he's here like this he's getting stabbed in the belly he's getting stabbed in the belly here and the other one is stabbing down at the back of his head here so you know the technique with one guy going like this and the other guy going like this. 
but because of the tactics, it was devastating. And um, I, I think it's important to, to understand this. In, in martial arts, sometimes we get too uh, sidetracked by nuances of technique, and we can do it. I think some of us need to do a better job of putting it in a, a, the larger context of what humans with a will to kill will be thinking and doing. Tell me, please, along your school, which schools do you think are also effective in critical situations? I have a general policy of avoiding comparisons between systems, um, martial art politics, particularly knife culture, martial art systems can be very touchy and very sensitive. And I, I try to avoid things that um, can get me in trouble politically. But uh, I'm, I'm very happy with the training that I've received from my teacher, girl Dan Inosanto. Uh, another one of my Filipino teachers was uh, Punam Gura Edgar Salite. I'm an instructor in his system. I was a private student of his. I've had uh, very good training from uh, Grand Tuan Leo Gaki of Bikiti Tertia. I've trained with him in his home in the Philippines. And uh, I've also had very good training from Tuan Chris Sayak of the Sayak system. And... Uh, others as well, but these are the ones who've been the most influenced on me. Uh, what time of improvised weapon, except firearms, uh, can seriously hinder the task of an aggressor? Uh, maybe some uh, ropes, clubs, and uh, someone else. Uh, ropes and cloths are used with, uh, you know, can have good effect. Uh, a lot of the sea lot systems you know, have uh, good material there. Uh, it's not something which has resonated for me so much, but um, I don't think there's one answer that suits everybody. Um, I think the ability to pick up things which can be used like a club is, is very important. So with my background and training, you know, with my stick fighting, you know, uh, you know I, I think a good club, a good a tennis racket could be a wonderful improvised club. Um, it's the skill of keeping somebody off of you with a stick or a, you know a club, uh, keeping a determined attacker away can be uh, it can be more of a challenge than many people realize. Again and again, we've seen in our dog brother fights, somebody one fighter drops a stick and the other fighter thinks, "Aha! I have a stick and you do not. I have the advantage," and he charges forward. And the other man just closes what we call the desperation close. He's, you know, motion, no mind. I must close and wrap this up so I don't get hit. And so he's very clear and spontaneous in his purpose. And a very high percentage of the time, he's able to close the distance. So to be able to keep somebody off of you with a stick is a study in its own right. Because when we're having, we're having a fight, so the tendency is to want to come forward. But in the circumstance of using a club against somebody with a knife or a stick against somebody with a knife, your purpose is to not let him come forward. So there's some important differences. Uh, our nickname for this is we call this Saint Foon. And this is um, a bit of an off-color joke. It's a way of saying, uh, stay the fornicate off of me. And so you know, the, the, the mindset of uh, creating a bubble with a club is a study in its own right. Tell me please, Mr. Denia, is it necessary to have uh, an especially training system uh, to study how to use improvised weapons? Because there are many kinds, many types of improvised weapons. I think the way to say it would be it is advantageous to have and understanding a methodology of some certain idioms of movement, certain methodology. Uh, to use a simple, obvious example, if you are familiar with an ice pick knife, you are then also familiar with a screwdriver or a pen because of the, the similar stabbing motions. Um, if you're familiar with a stick, you're going to be able to pick up, pick up a piece of construction lumber. You're going to be able to use a tennis racket uh, a fishing pole, it's going to be more of a whip-like motion. It's good to be 
familiarize yourself with the particulars of various common objects, but there are going to be certain consistent idioms of movement. Give an advice to one who encountered a person with a knife and he can't run away. For example, closed flat and there are two ones. Yeah? First man have a knife and he is ready to kill you. Yeah? Or kill another man. And what, what can you uh, recommend to those second one? How to defend? The first thing, I, it, it may sound strange, but the first thought is remember to breathe. Because in the fear and the adrenaline, it's very easy, you know, and you forget to breathe. And in five or ten seconds, you're out of oxygen because your heart's beating so fast, it's burned up all the oxygen that's in your blood, and you're, you're out of gas very quickly. Remember to breathe. Um, remember to think, to remember the ways in which you are dangerous too. It might be as simple as he is running at you. Uh, Alu Akbar, I am going to kill you. You look at the footage of the jihadis as they, you know, they're coming. They're coming to kill. There's no doubt. But actually, what they're doing, it's the extremely, you know, you know, uh, monkey simple, e e e like this. And so, well, sometimes when they wind up like this, you can punch, you know, you can punch them in the chin, you know, in the jaw, and stun him, or maybe if you're lucky, knock him out, but diminish him. So remember your potential to be aggressive as well. The person with the knife is often, he is assuming you are going to be afraid. He is assuming you are going to be defensive and reactive. But if you remember that you too are dangerous, I think that, you know, I think that's a helpful thing. Then there's the particular particulars of the techniques and, uh, you know, well, and against this angle, against that angle. Uh, which grip is he, is, you know, the basic one is either an ice pick or a hammer. Um, in a high adrenal state, you may not notice whether he's uh, edge out or edge in, which certainly can be important. So the, the calmer you can stay, the, the breathing helps with that, and the more that you can notice things. Uh, Mr. Denny, as for you, who is the most skilled master in the world who has fought with empty handed against a knife? I'm a bit reluctant to say the most, but because um, there's many people of whom we don't know who may have shown great skill. Uh, knife people tend to be very secretive, um, but I think the the Filipino tradition has produced many men of, of, of great skill who have fought with and against blades. Um, one of my teachers is a man by the name of um, uh, Grandmaster Leo Horan of uh, Bahala Na Arnis. Uh, and he was a uh, Filipino who was in California when World War II began, and he joined what became one of the two Filipino battalions in the U.S. Army. And uh, the U.S. Army was so impressed with the Filipinos' use of the bolo, what's sometimes called a machete, that uh, for them, they gave them, they, they allowed them to use their bolos as part of their standard kit. And uh, Grandmaster Huron was selected by General Douglas MacArthur to be part of a team that went into the Philippines, the island of Luzon, to uh, report back on what the Japanese were doing and to harass the enemy. And so this is a man who was in many close quarter uh, combat situations uh, with the Japanese in World War II. And the jungles can be very heavy, so the distance is very close, and uh, often at night, often ambush. Uh, talking about tactics, they sometimes would take a, a can of food and they would put some little holes in the bottom of the can so that terrible bacteria would grow in the jungle heat, and then they would leave the can of food where the Japanese soldiers could find it. And then they would wait for them to get very sick in their stomach from the bad food, and then they would attack them at night. So, you know, they're weak, it's night, and they would run through the Japanese position, slicing them up with their, their bolos and the machetes because they didn't want to give away their position at night with the gunfire. So they had the machete in one hand and the gun in the other hand. And, you know, sometimes they'd be there in a three-man position, one in front, two men here. And so uh, Grandmaster Huron was the point man. And so here comes a Japanese soldier charging the rifle with the very long bayonet and would parry it off to one side, and then he would put in a cut or two 
with the, uh, the machete, with the bolo, and then he would pass him to the man on this side or to the man on this side to finish the kill. Uh, so this is part of the tradition uh, of the Philippines. He, he was one man, of, one man of many who was using the blade in modern combat. So um, in, in these situations, things have been done. But it, it, these are things hard to record, so I don't know if I could say, you know, who is the most or the best. But, you know, I, I think it's, it, it's wise for all of us to be humble about the diversity of human experience and where we fit. Mr. Daniel, thank you for such complex conversation. I appreciate you, and uh, I'm, there is no doubt that uh, it's not our last interview with you. Thank you very much. All right, my great pleasure. Special ribbon. Go there. Ты пришел к нам на состязание? По каким правилам будем драться? У нас нет правил.